So what's the whole idea behind the Sicilian defense? It allows black to attack the d4 square and fight for the center without the symmetry that results from 1, e5. So most of the times, black remains with two pawns on the center and that's what the wing gambit tries to challenge. The wing gambit can be used to crush Sicilian defense players and also French defense players. We just want to build a strong center and then take black out of his preparation. So let's get started. So the Sicilian defense begins with the moves e4, c5. From here, black expects to see knight to f3 by white. Then from here, it all depends on what black chooses to play. For example, black can go g6, which mostly transposes into the dragon system. Black can also choose to go pawn to e6, which mostly transposes into the Khan Sicilian. Or the popular pawn to d6 with an intention of playing the Najof. Knight to c6 is always on the plate with an intention of entering into the realms of the Rosalimo attack. And the rare pawn to a6, which is known as the Lazy Sicilian. So this is all what black is expecting to see on the board and believe it or not Sicilian players are all prepared for these moves. However, with the wing gambit we can avoid all of black's nonsense in the Sicilian defense and instead go pawn to b4 intending to take the whole center and making black to play on our terms. We do not want to play what a Sicilian player wants. So after pawn to e4 by white, black responds with pawn to c5 as usual. So from here, we're going to play pawn to b4, shifting black's attention away from the center. So the whole idea behind the wing gambit is to dominate the center with our center pawns. And most of the times you will see us sacrificing the air pawn as well so that we can have three pawns on the center. From here, the common response by black is take on b4, after which we play a3. The idea is to get rid of this pawn completely out of existence. In most cases, you will see black taking on a3 as well, which we want to see on the board. In this position, even though you can take with the knight or the rook, I recommend that you take with the bishop. The idea is just to keep an eye on the a f diagonal. Idea is that if black pushes his e pawn, then we are going to take the bishop on f8, taking away black's right to castle. And this would disturb his Sicilian theory. For example, black here can continue with knight to c6, and then after pawn to d4 by white, taking over the center, if black plays, let's say, pawn to e6, we are going to take the bishop on f8 right away. And if king takes, now you can see that black has lost his right to castle. In the wing gambit, the main area of our meet is these two pawns here. And in this position, I have highlighted a number of arrows, how white can continue from here, and the most common responses by black. So guys, now this is the moment of silence. If you ever doubt the wing gambit, you can just try to view it in the likes of the Benko gambit with a tempo up. So from here, the most common move order that you are going to see, and which is also my favorite, is knight to f3 by white, d5 by black, e5 by white, knight ge7 by black, c3, g6 by black, h4 from us. So the idea is just to start attacking on the king's side with our pawns as fast as we can, intending to go h5 next. So if h5 by black, which you are going to see most of the times, bishop d3 makes sense for us, just a developing move. And here you will see black playing his king on g7, after which we should castle short, securing our king. And if knight to f5 by black, just take that active piece out of the game. And then most of the times you will see black capturing with his g pawn plan is very simple and our knight on f3 will go to g5 eyeing the f7 square and our knight on b1 will go to a3 b5 and finally to d6 eyeing the f7 square as well and i should mention from here that pawn to a6 by black does not stop us from putting our knight on b5 because black's rook on a8 is undefended or in other words, it is pinned by our rook on a1. So the pawn on a6 cannot take our knight on b5. The rook on f1 will most of the time go to e1, then e3, and then g3. With some discoveries, possibilities on the king. So now you have seen how simple it is to play the wing gambit. And you are going to have similar structures most of the times. As you can see, we still have our center pawns intact. That cannot be easily destroyed by black. And if I can give you some time to think about this position, it doesn't even look like a Sicilian position. And that's the power of the wing gambit. 
even though we are a pond down, if you put this on stockfish, stockfish will give us an advantage in this position. Before I continue, if you like this video so far, please consider subscribing and also share your comments down below and don't forget to hit the like button. In this case, I'm giving you 4 seconds to subscribe to my channel in order to help my channel grow and allow me make more wonderful content just like this one. Now in this position, instead of knight to c6 by black, oftentimes you will see him playing pawn to g6. So the idea is very simple. Here black wants to fianchero his bishop on g7. For example, after knight to f3, bishop g7 attacking our rook on a1 will go d4. Again, we have these two powerful center pawns, which we do not attain in the normal Sicilian. And our Benko like bishop here still eyes the f8 square. From here, black may continue with knight to c6, then c3. Now we have three pawns on the center. Look how beautiful that is. Knight to f6 by black, e5. Look at that pawn structure again. So black will go knight to d5 most of the time. Bishop c4 attacking the knight. Knight to b6. Bishop a2. Look at these two powerful bishops pointing towards the king side. Where is black even going to castle? Anyways, black castle short, white castle short d6 by black, e takes d6, e takes d6, rook e1 by us, bishop g4 by black, knight bd2, rook e8 by black, which is a blunder because we are going to take that rook and then if queen takes, take on d6 with our bishop winning back our pawn. And now we are even way better than black. Now I should mention that you do not have to worry about these two pawns because in the long run, Black's B pawn will be traded with our C pawn. And here we already have a passer on D4. Black's A pawn is overwhelmed by our minor pieces that could take it. Now back to this position. After knight to C6 and pawn to D4, instead of pawn to E6, Black can also play pawn to D6 this time. So let's see what the continuation can be from here. Pawn to D6 by Black and I have highlighted the arrows depicting how the game can go from here. Not to mention that we still have our two powerful pawns on the center again. So for example, white may go knight to f3, just normal developing moves. There is no much memorization here. Our main idea is just to strengthen our center and supporting our center pawns with our minor pieces such as the knights and the bishops. Knight to f6 may be played by black. From here we can play pawn to d5 attacking the knight on c6. Now. When you put this on stockfish, it will tell you that the best response is for black to retrieve his knight on b8, which is a drawback. For example, if black's knight goes to e5, we take that knight on e5, then after pawn takes on e5, we play queen to d3. Then here black may play pawn to g6, uh, planning to fianchero his bishop, then we play c4. So again, you, you can see how strong our pawns are on the center. So after bishop g7, we play bishop e2, castle shot by black. And here you can see that even though black has managed to castle, we are still eyeballing the f8 square, indirectly attacking his rook on f8. And so from here, we are going to castle shot as well. b6 by black, trying to develop his bishop, the knight d2 by white. Again, I would love to mention something here. Our b knight oftentimes will be going to d2, the long-term plan from here is to go knight to f3, then knight to g5, provided that we have already played pawn to h4. And whenever you play pawn to h4, you will see black responding with h5, which leaves his position somewhat weak. And again here, you can see how powerful our pawns are on the center, and black cannot do anything to break our strong center. So again, that was just in a d6 line, so let's go back. Now back to the first position, after pawn to e4 and cc5, it's not really a prerequisite that we should always go pawn to b4. We can instead delay the wing gambit with a move knight to f3, which is most of the times called the delay wing gambit and uh, it transposes most of the times into the accelerated uh, wing gambit. And, and this is one of Carlsen's favorite gambits and I'm going to show you in a minute. So from here you see black responding with knight to c6 stopping our pawn to d4. So we are still going to play pawn to b4 and believe it or not, this is also playable even in rapid games. So the common response by black is c takes on b4, then a3 we continue with our main strategy, 
e5 by black, bishop b2 attacking the e5 pawn. So you see black responding with d6. Idea is just to defend the pawn on e5 and also intending to play bishop to g4 pinning our knight. So from here we are going to take the pawn on b4. Then after knight takes we play c3 chasing black's knight away. Then knight c6 d4. Again you can see this pawn chain appearing. Knight to f6 by black. Bishop d3. Bishop e7. Knight bd2. Castle shot by black. Castle shot by white. s6 by black. Aiming to go b5. h3 by us. Just stopping bishop to g4 or knight to g4 h6 by black, bishop a3, again eyeballing the f8 square indirectly. So rook e8 by black, d5 by white, again harassing that black's knight. Now in this position, after b4, if knight takes instead of the pawn, we'll still get back to similar positions. For example, if knight takes, we go pawn to c3, knight c6, then d4. After c takes on d4, we just take back the pawn and still have these two good pawns on the center now in the intro i mentioned that the wing gambit can also be used against french players how the french defense is where white starts with pawn to e4 and then black responds with e6 so let's see how we can achieve the wing gambit beginning with the move knight to f3 so the problem with uh, the french defense is that uh, moves are well known just like in the Karakan defense so black is going to play from here d5 after which we are going to respond with pawn to e5 now 99 percent of the time if not 100 you will still see black going pawn to c5 because that's what they are taught in the french defense so let's say after pawn to c5 by black we still play b4 which is still called the wing gambit so after c takes on b4 we play a3 again with the same ideas now after b takes on a3 we do not take with our bishop because we do not want to exchange bishops right in the opening so from here we are going to solidify our center with a move pawn to d4 then after knight to c6 by black we play c3 completing our pawn chain and now you can see how powerful our pawns on the center are yet again a6 is the most common response by black intending to go pawn to b5 at some later stage then from here we're going to play bishop d3 just eyeballing the h7 square once again so b5 by black castle shot b4 then here most of the times we are going to take a black spawn on b4 and here i should mention that knight takes on b4 is not really a good move by black because we can pin his knight to the bishop and that's why oftentimes here you see black taking with his bishop and not his knight and then we take on a3 with our knight not our bishop so here you can see that we have a fixed pawn structure and uh, two solid uh, center pawns and here you can see that black's a pawn is not that strong it won't go anywhere most of the times we we'll we'll capture this pawn Okay, so the next section of this video is where I'm going to show you five games that were played by Magnus Carlsen against his fellow GMs using the wing gambit to defeat each one of them.